There were a bunch of slides at the beginning. Did you want to, or you, uh, my slides are, are later in this presentation that I got sent. It's Montana. Yeah, I, I, I think that from those uh, which are present now, everyone was in the last workshop or the workshop before. So is there anyone who doesn't know, uh, not know the current state of proposal development, let's say, or scheme development? Should we just go quickly through it or can we uh, hop to the next point? I don't know. We, we can shortly introduce what we have done so far. Or just go to the next point. Norbert, are you familiar yeah. with with the current state of development? Not really. So going through it uh, would be nice. Just okay. quick steps through it. Um, Robert, will you you do that, or should I? Yeah, you should do it. Okay. Um, you can speak to these slides, I think, more effectively. Okay. Um, and I can tell me when to advance, and I'll go ahead and advance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, um, the um, um, the basic idea for this quality scheme is that we have an, a scheme that is uh, this, that enables us to um, oh yeah perfect that enables us um, to apply um, um, oh, just this morning once more. Um, the basic idea of the scheme is that we have, we can focus on uncertainties, on, on the methodological quality and on the perturbation effects and that this, uh, those informations is um, implemented in a kind of combined quality score um, that makes it possible to see everything in, on, 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 on one, uh, on the first view, let's say. And um, it, it, in that sense, it advances um, the, all the quality schemes from before because, um, or from earlier, because those schemes were simply based on a, on a description and then a, a rough categorization in categories A to D or something like this. And um, the idea here is that we can a bit more um, um, differentiate between really uh, um, the quantification of uncertainties or the description of the methodological uh, quality itself. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, what, what I already mentioned uh, allows a quick comparison of the first evaluation. Next slide, please. Um, so the first part is about uncertainty quantification. This is not uh, fully solved yet. The, we made a proposal um, that we um, can work with coefficient of variation. But there is not a decision or was not made a decision uh, about this a final decision yet. Um, but it, the basic idea is simply that we uh, categorize the uncertainty based on uh, the coefficient of variation uh, from the conductivity uh, measurements and the uh, numbers of temperatures. So um, this is, I think, what we have to look on in details um, during the in-person meeting uh, in two weeks in Potsdam. Next, please. So, um, and this is a bit weird in a, in a follow-up of the slides. Anyway, okay. Um, probably the basic idea here of the, um, of the um, combined score can be seen here. So we have a com combination of, of letters and uh, uh, numbers uh, apparently. So um, we have the first uh, two letters and numbers, which gives a rating of the uncertainty. The third and the fourth, the rating of the, the methods in terms of conductivity and uh, temperature gradient. And after the dot, there are a number of, uh, of letters, uh, uh, upper and lower letters, um, that describe whether a uh, a topo uh, perturbation effect is present at this location or for this uh, value or not, and if it was corrected, if present or not. Um, so actually with this kind of score, you can evaluate um, all those aspects uh, with one on one view uh, in the first view, and uh, uh, you can compare different values uh, in this term. Next, please. Probably the important part here is that um, if we agree on that, finally, um, it will uh, it demands for small adjustments in the current structure of the database. 
but um, I think this is um, this is a good idea in any way because I think over the first year of using those structure, there are appearing some small uh, aspects that should be changed or fixed. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, the third part, and this slide actually should be uh, positioned before the last one, is uh, the evaluation of the methods itself. And um, here the basic idea is that um, one can look on conductivity aspects and temperature gradient aspects and um, put this in a matrix uh, coming out of the sc of scoring and uh, how we achieve those matrix uh, we can see on the next slide because it requires different steps. Uh, to go. So next slide, please. Exactly, for the conductivity uh, dimension, um, there are two steps. Um, first, um, the one, the workflow on the left side. So we are asking for whether we have original data for the interval depth, um, where uh, or how those depths are selected and uh, whether we have direct observation for conductivity for those intervals. And if this is the case, or even if this is not the case, um, we come out with a value range uh, defined between 0.2 and 1.1. And then we have a second step. And the second step uh, focuses uh, uh, here on two dimensions. The first dimension is uh, um, the presence of, or the, uh, the conditions under which the conductivity has been determined. So saturation uh, status and uh, in situ pressure temperature state. And the second dimension is, um, you can see on the more or less x axis here, uh, the source uh, of the conductivity and com both combined uh, with those uh, um, rating values you can see gray shaded or in gray color uh, gives you let's say an, a score value between 0.56 and uh, 1.0 uh, so apparently a saturated in situ uh, determination of conductivity using probably colloc integration is much more valuable than uh, a dry measured uh, ambient data from lithological uh, analysis uh, so this is the basic idea to get into a differentiation here. And combining both scores gives you then a final value range um, that goes into the primary scheme we have seen this slide before. So next step, please. Uh, so this was more or less the left side of the conductivity scheme, which is now green colored here. And uh, the upper uh, scale on the temperature gradient, this is a simple differentiation between, uh, we see, uh, single BHT measurements still perturbed without any corrections uh, and uh, uh, probably high precision temperature locks which are measured in equilibrium uh, and they uh, those data span a range between 0.5 and 1.0 and uh, the combination of both and gives you a, a a accumulated uh, gradient and uh, not a uh, gradient accumulated score let's say not accumulated uh, yeah, a product score yeah. which uh, uh, can then be used uh, press the button please um, next slide this term which can be used uh, and we can go to the next this is not needed now Exactly, which can be used uh, for a rough categorization uh, into categories M1, M2, M3, M4, and so on. Uh, um, the, uh, the margins of those categories we have to still to determine, so this is not fixed yet, but this is the basic idea how one can achieve such a categorization. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, okay, next. Yeah, and this is just uh, for clarification, um, because if you apply such a score apparently to the to the child elements uh, of a location, then the question is how those information can be transmitted from a child to a parent level, so to the level of the representative value for the location. And though there was a, um, a suggestion or the proposal that the, the poorest information is inherited from the child to the parent level, um, but this is also this was also a proposal and is not yet fixed. Probably there are cl more clever ways to do this. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and then probably one uh, 
one important part we need to solve is still the question um, how how an interval is evaluated in terms of the representativeness of conductivity and temperature gradient determined uh, compared or uh, compared to the length of the interval. So um, th this addresses a bit the uh, the uncertainty part of those scoring scheme, um, but is not solved yet. And um, yeah, then the question shut in time. This was this is a slide a bit older from from the third or the final outcome of the third workshop. So there was a question whether we use shut in time, uh, for example, um, to come to thresholds for the evaluation scheme. But um, uh, as far as I recognize, um, we decided differently in the temperature workshop last time uh, to not include it, uh, but to make it easier to handle the temperature scheme. Yeah. So okay, so next slide. Yeah, that's the short version of what we have accumulated over the last four workshops. And um, then Rob can take over. Okay, so uh, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, present this information. And so uh, my understanding is that there were a number of questions about marine heat flow and how it fit into kind of the, the heat flow database and how the differences between kind of continental heat flow and marine heat flow. And so that's what I'm going to address today. Uh, and so many of the, uh, and we'll kind of go through the history of it a little bit, but I just wanted to start with uh, some fundamentals. So many of the marine heat flow measurements are made with a, a probe like this. They come in different size and shapes and different ways of measuring temperature and thermal conductivity. Here I have uh, Fourier's law showing that, you know, our calculation of heat flow is the product of the thermal conductivity and the temperature gradient. And so we need to be able to measure both of those quantities. And uh, this particular probe is a three and a half meter uh, Lister uh, or violin uh, probe. So the, the strength member is shown here. And then there's a uh, thin uh, high precision thermistor string uh, with, a, I think uh, in this case, um, 10 thermistors in it. And then there's a weight, this weight stand, there's a data logger to record the data. And in some way you wanna be able to, um, to acoustically or uh, in some other way, uh, send the data up to the ship in near real time, ideally to make sure that the probe is working. Uh, so with these probes, you need sediment. Uh, so uh, you lower the probe off the back of the ship. It plunges into the sediment. Here I just am showing a subset of the thermistors. And, we, and for each thermistor then, we get a temperature time series that looks something like that. This is temperature, here's time. And we get a, a, a temperature time series for each probe. And so uh, before you plunge it into the sediments, you record a, a bottom water temperature, maybe you're 100 meters off the bottom, it plunges into the sediment and you see the frictional heating of uh, the thermistor string going into the sediment uh, and then it, it relaxes uh, for about seven minutes. These are not equilibrium temperatures, but this is long enough to be able to confidently extrapolate to an equilibrium temperature. So now we have an equilibrium temperature for each thermistor. We know the spacing between the thermistors, not necessarily the depth relative to seafloor, but the spacing uh, between each thermistor and then that gives us uh, the thermal gradient. A calibrated, in this case, a calibrated heat pulse is fired. So we know how much heat is going into the sediment and the way that decays gives the thermal conductivity and then there's a little bit of friction when we pull the uh, probe out of the bottom. So that's one way uh, that, that the heat flow measurements work. And uh, um, so let's see. So there's a number of different styles. Uh, this is a, a different style with, instead of a long uh, thermistor string, we have uh, outrigger probes and you can see the outrigger probes here on a core barrel like this. And uh, sometimes you'll, uh, uh, 
uh, be able to also get. Uh, so then these uh, thermistor probes are rotated around uh, the thermistor, uh, the strength member. They're offset uh, from uh, the, the strength member. And we can also get a thermal gradient. And if it has the capability to fire a heat pulse as shown here, this is kind of in the last uh, scheme. Uh, we're just firing a heat, uh, kind of a concentrated heat pulse and then watching the decay. In this uh, string, we're firing a, a, a continuous heating source. Uh, and so the way that the, the thermistors warm, warm up gives you the thermal conductivity. Uh, this style uses more power. Uh, so maybe uh, if you're using batteries, it has a greater drain on batteries. And so uh, might not be as good for a, 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 for a long deployment with uh, many measurements. Uh, there's other techniques for measuring the heat flow. Another one is using an ROV with a, uh, a one meter probe or, or something like that hanging from uh, ROV. Uh, and in this case, uh, you can use uh, tilt as an important parameter. Uh, in this case, you can use the tilt of the ROV to figure out the tilt of the heat flow probe. Uh, this probe isn't, uh, is just sticking out like this, but when it's being deployed on the bottom, the probe would rotate to vertical. Uh, on this uh, ROV, the probe was mounted perpendicularly uh, to the ROV and then uh, use a hydraulic uh, uh, pump uh, to put it into the seafloor. We can also have uh, 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 temperature probes that are inserted with the arm of an ROV as well. Uh, let's see, here's another case um, where uh, thermistors are put onto the side of a core barrel. So you can recover the core. At the same time, you get a thermal gradient measurement uh, with these uh, thermistors and then use uh, the recovered core material to make thermal conductivity measurements. So this would be another style as well. This is, uh, you know, because you fill up the core barrel with uh, sediment, uh, you can you have to uh, you make uh, measurements you know one at a time you have to deploy the, the the gravity core in this case or the piston core and then recover it set it up another time for another core uh, let's see uh, and then here's another example of using uh, thermistors attached to core barrels and in those cases where you get the cores then you would measure uh, in the previous examples with the uh, uh, heat flow probes, thermal conductivity was being measured in situ, right in the sediment, as because the probes uh, penetrated into that sediment. In this case, with the coral barrels, thermal conductivity is measured in the lab on the ship as the core comes up with uh, these needle probes. And in this case, you would have to make a, a temperature and a pressure correction uh, to uh, get an in-situ value of thermal conductivity. Okay, and then there's a, just a number of different uh, styles of probes that have been uh, developed. Uh, and I think the first measurements were made in the 50s with a so-called Bullard probe, where it just had a thin uh, thermistor string and, and thermistors embedded within it, and, uh, but it was hard to keep it straight. Uh, it, during the deployment of the, or the penetration of the probe into the sediment or pulling it back out. So the next style was the so-called Ewing probe with these outrigger probes on the side of a strong uh, strength member to keep the probe straight. Uh, but in this case, uh, no thermal conductivity was collected uh, with these uh, thermistors. I think the next iteration is uh, the violin bow the, uh, that was designed uh, by Clive Lister. Uh, and, and this is a, has turned out to be a robust kind of modern design. Uh, Dick von Herzen uh, developed ways to, uh, to uh, measure thermal conductivity in situ. So maybe in the, the scheme of things, this might have come before the Lister probe uh, showing, showing here. But in both of these cases, you get both the thermal conductivity and the in-situ value of, uh, you get the thermal gradient and the in-situ value of thermal conductivity, excuse me. Uh, and then there's some other uh, autonomous uh, uh, 
uh, oh, and then this is with uh, cor uh, coring, uh, piston core or gravity core, and you would get the thermal conductivity with the recovered uh, sediment inside the cores. Okay. So those are the different types and the things, uh, you know, that you would uh, want to note are the, the length of the, uh, of the uh, probe, you know, whether or not penetration was full, that is, did all thermistors go into the sediment, the number of thermistors, information like that. Okay, and then uh, another uh, kind of style of, of getting heat flow measurements uh, with, uh, through drilling is either uh, with a coring shoe uh, when you are um, Piston coring, this is the uh, IODP uh, drill ship, uh, Joides resolution. So that you're, you're coring along and there's a, a thermistor in the coring shoe. And so what happens is you're at, you uh, are at the bottom of the hole. This gets hydraulically shot ahead of the bottom of the, of the hole a few meters. Uh, and then you would get a temperature time series like the first half of, of what I showed where you would see the frictional heat of penetration. And then you, you get the, uh, a temperature measurement, cover the core, maybe take another core, then take another temperature measurement. And again, thermal conductivity values would be measured on that recovered core. And then, when, and this is good for soft sediments. When sediments get more indurated, you need a separate tool uh, trip. And this is uh, a temperature probe to get temperature measurements in more indurated uh, sediment. Okay, so um, let's see, operationally, you wanna uh, also know the tilt, right? Because we want, uh, with the, those probes, if the probe is tilted, then the, uh, you have to make a correction for the, the depth difference between each thermistors. Uh, you wanna get equilibrium uh, temperatures. Um, and then in terms of environmental corrections, and, and these are, you know, these are models, but we want to uh, be able to account for variations in the bathymetry that causes heat refraction, say with a constant um, bottom, bottom water temperature. Uh, bottom water temperature can vary, so that can impart a perturbation. Generally, that can happen, uh, you know, in deep water where there are western boundary currents, but in general, if you're in water depths greater than a kilometer or so, unless there's a western boundary current, you're probably okay in terms of uh, bottom water temperature variations. Sedimentation uh, can reduce the value of, of heat flow that you're actually observing relative to kind of the basal heat flux that you want. And, uh, and then if there's uh, thermal conductivity contrast, say between a thin uh, sediment cover and uh, basement relief, uh, you might correct for that as well. But again, you know, these are all models. And so you want to note the value, you know, how that model was generated, what the value is, and then how that, uh, you know, is applied to uh, kind of the observed heat flow value. Okay, and so then here is uh, kind of the database with the different entries, uh, site name, latitude and longitude. I should say positioning uh, uh, typically with the probes has been tough. I think with modern uh, technology, the probe position can be precisely located with respect to the ship, but that's only maybe come online in the past five years or so. Uh, so generally the ship location is taken as the location of the probe. But you know that could be off depending on water depth and stuff like that by a few hundred meters. Uh, the geographic um, or maybe tectonic environment is important. Uh, the primary reference where the data comes from. Uh, let's see some other things uh, in here. Uh, kind of the geographic elevation that would be the water depth acquisition things like that. So those are the parent level items, uh, child level. Uh, the heat flow value, the observed heat flow value, the uncertainty, that's going to be, uh, you know, thermal conductivity measurements in situ or maybe good to five, seven percent, something like that. Uh, how the heat flow method, whether you use Fourier's uh, law or uh, use uh, uh, thermal resistance uh, in, in the case where you're seeing variations in thermal conductivity with depth. The heat flow interval, uh, we don't really know 
the top thermistor, right? You don't know how deep that top thermistor is in the sediment. Okay, so that, that could be a little bit of, of a challenge. Pe same with the penetration depth. You know the number of thermistors that are in the bottom and you can kind of figure out you know, how deep it might be because you know the length of the probe and maybe if not all thermistors penetrate, then you could say, okay, you know, thermistors, th uh, you know, uh, usually we count the thermistors from the bottom. So the deepest thermistor is, is one and then the top thermistor might be 11 or, you know, whatever, maybe only the, the you know, thermistors one through five went in. So you could kind of get a penetration depth, probe uh, type, probe length is important. You know, and then here are the different uh, perturbation effects, okay? And then, uh, so, and we, we could go through those if you want, and the temperature gradient, gradient uncertainty, number of thermistors again, mean gradient, corrected gradient, things like that, probe tilt. So that's what I had. I probably went through that pretty quickly, but um, let me know if there's any questions or comments. So, so Rob, yes. So I think it was it was clear. So maybe um, the idea was probably now to to go on and to look if if we could use uh, the same quality scheme that was proposed for the for the borehole data or uh, adapted. So we didn't have really time or to to discuss or to propose something. But uh, what we could do, and what I what I put it in, in your presentation, was the a bit how the, what were the the possibilities in the previous format of the database, and what are the the elements that were used at the time to to assess a bit the, the quality of the of the data. And then we can maybe look together how we could uh, which elements we could take over from the from the borehole quality scheme and which ones we have to, to, to change. I think probably most of them, but the idea is probably the could, could be adopted. Adapt. So I don't, don't remember what I put exactly in, in, your, in the next slide, but. Uh, we see, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, then, uh, yeah. So these are uh, slides that you added in. I guess yeah, well, I, forgot that. I forgot those were at the end. Sorry about that. Well, I was, I just took a little bit, uh, the, this is the format, so before the, the new format, uh, the one that was was laid out by uh, by Jessup in 1976, I think. So just to point out that, that uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, items that could be used and that were used probably by by some of us to, to, to uh, assess the quality. But one of the major thing was one that was in the description codes. It was a bit complicated at the time because there was not all the, everything was in codes because there was not a lot of place eh, to describe everything. Mm -hmm. So between, in one of the codes, which is, is uh, code six, was the consistency. So which is a variation oh, yeah. of heat flow uh, with the depth mainly. So, and this was categorized in five categories. So, the first one was less than 10% or full probe penetration, which was the, 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 the best quality score. And then you go down, so then there is greater than 10 or less than 20% or a probe tilt of 15 to 30 degrees. Then you had C greater than 20% or probe tilt 30 degrees or only uh, one sediment temperature. And then you had D probe tilt not determined and E uh, in the indeterminate. So this was the way I think the, the quality was uh, assessed at that time, mostly. So there are a few, there were a few other schemes existing here. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. So you have the Lamondority one had some scheme that existed already before. 
And Lucas o, in his uh, adopted version of this database, he also used a scheme that basically is the same, but slight, slightly, some slight modifications uh, of it. So I don't know if, if we go to the next slide. Oh, there was one before. Oh, this one. Yeah, well, just to show, of course, that in, uh, there are other elements said, and of course, there is also the corrections. So here it was, of this was for, of course, all data, yeah? uh, probe data and borehole data. So um, we have to see a little bit uh, which one we adopt for the for the for the probe uh, data. And uh, there was also code seven, which might be of uh, importance to us, huh? which is the, the water temperature gradient uh, profile code. So this might be interesting for us also to, to put it somewhere in the scheme. Uh, um, we have to see that. Then there are some other elements here on, on the main uh, in the main list, which is like water depth. As uh, Rob already said, we, we know that deeper than one kilometer water depth, we have mostly relatively stable bottom water conditions, but it's not always the case. Eh? We know that there are cases where this can still change a lot. Um, of course, the penetration depth of the probe, the number of temperature measurements and the conductivity mm -hmm. measurements. Mm -hmm. And I also highlighted a year of publication, but I, I don't think this should come into the, the quality scheme. But it's some element that is often used also to discriminate or to 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 get some higher quality data out of the beta databases to eliminate at some early years um, where acquisition was not uh, was only analog and, and so there were some more problems at that time. Yeah. Go to the next. Uh, Jeffrey. So, yeah. Um, just one question or one hint um, um, for so um, for how a reason um, we need to restart the Zoom session um, because something went wrong with the license. Apparently, I apologize for that. Uh, I've put the link into the chat. Uh, sorry for the short interruption. Um, uh, as soon as I have started restarted the session in thirty seconds, we can you can just start and I will start the recording. Take I don't. I just had a look at the um, Lucas so that's roughly like 70,000. That takes you eight years <laughs> of just data entry more or less. Yeah, that is um, the reason why we try to, uh, to create those collaborative networks um, yeah. and to distribute the work to many, many different desks. <laughs> Who's missing? Rachel is still missing. And Jeffrey as well. Okay. Sorry, Harry. I have a question or, or a comment yes. about measurements. I've been in, a, uh, in three campaigns, seafood campaign, one uh, in a Chile trench with the sonar ship, another one uh, in, in Antarctica, and another one in uh, yeah. in, in the Mediterranean Sea. And in this, in two cases, the cable cut and the prof will lose the, the prof forever. That's happened a lot. In my case, three campaigns, two profs uh, were, were, were lose. This is typical because, the, you know, this is a cable, a coaxial cable, sending the, 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 the measurements to the lab and everything. But happened twice and we, we lose the, the, the prof. I don't know if you have experience with this situation that, is exceptional that, or not that has never happened to me i've been out on many heat flow 
marine heat flow campaigns, but um, but I know that it's happened to other people as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's happened to us. Oh, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it was kind of frustrating because we were not in Antarctica seas or anything like that. We were in the calm waters of the Gulf of California and uh, we were doing a, a heat flow of, um, campaign in the northern part of the Gulf uh, and a particularly shallow ba basin uh, called Wagner Basin. The problem was the cable was also a, a coaxial cable, and I think it was under under the speci under specified for the probe. And so we had some movement during the night, and yeah, I, I think the the other problem with us specifically it was that we didn't have any uh, dynamic positioning system in the sh in the ship. So the captain was trying to maintain the position of the of the of the pro by you know laying cable all the time and so our theory is that the cable kind of uh, turning on itself mm -hmm. and it probably that's why it broke so we know that the pro is only a hundred meters depth and we know exactly what it is but um we don't have the resources to to take it out from the bottom but yeah i know i know what you're talking about and it's it's awful <laughs> Yeah, with with, with the, the Sony ship in, in the Chile Trench, it was like uh, uh, seven kilometers depth, deep, and 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 and, and the, the 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 probe remained there with uh, four uh, with uh, four kilometers uh, cable. So I wow. think it was it was um, the more expensive. The cable that remained in the the sea floor that the the probe itself. The blues, yeah, and, uh, probably. We, we we try to to fish it with a, I don't know it's another cable and and some uh, hooks and things like that, but it was impossible. So wow. no, uh, so this is my 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 experience with the <laughs> with, with with the sea floor measurements and uh, with the but. Uh, on the other way, the, the, the measurements are very easy to take and uh, very nice to, to, to look at So and to work with. I was very happy with this because comparing with the measurements in, in boreholes and in ground in onshore is like uh, much more easier. Yeah, I, I agree. But yeah, it's all so, stable. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Which... And sorry, sorry, Rob. No, it's okay. I, I would say in the except when I went out with Norbert in the uh, on the uh, Zona, I, I've never used a, 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 a fiber optic cable. We we use uh, trawl wires and then send mm -hmm. the send a portion of the data up acoustically. Mm -hmm. So maybe Jeffrey, you can take over again and continue Norbert, where we have been interrupted. Yes. Okay. So I took over on, on this slide uh, the item that, that we discussed already before and that should probably somewhere be used in, uh, in the quality scheme. Um, I will maybe not go uh, through it uh, again. I just want to say that there is probably also some question of, of um, um, the non-probe data that uh, Rob showed uh, offshore, the, the borehole data, but also like, for example, Mabel data. Um, will they fit, should we, should they be able to fit in this scheme, probe data, or should they be able to fit in one of the boreholes? And probably, well, for borehole, it's probably more adapted with them in that one. So these are just some uh, reflections I, I had. So I think it's maybe better now that we that we take up the scheme that was made for the for the borehole data. I don't know if it's on the on the slide. There yes, is a slide. Or if it we is. Go back to the beginning of the Of course, a major difference here is the, 
well, one of the major differences is, is, is of the, 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 the bottom water effect eh, that we have, which can be very important for a lot of data that are not certainly the one that are not so in not such deep water depths. And at least more and more data are collected in, in these areas because they're interesting, of course. The shelves, the slopes, and uh, well, shelf may be rare, but still people do it. And <laughs> we, we should be able to, to assess this, uh, this quality. Um, so I don't know if we can try to put the slide where we have the, we had more or less the, the where is the scheme for the borehole data. I was not there in the two previous workshops, so I'm, I'm maybe not, also not fully acquainted with it, but well, Sven gave a good introduction on it, so it's, it's rather clear. Um, I don't know, Rob, is it, do you have the hand on the slides or? Yeah, uh, yeah, you want me to go? Uh, yeah, see. probably back to the one in the beginning where there was the... This one? No, er, earlier, the one that uh, before your, yeah, that Sven showed. So one yeah. of the, one of these, yes, maybe. Uh, oh, no, 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 the one before, before. <laughs> with the... can, I, can I ask a quick question? Um, that data qualification scheme does great literature or a technical report, like anything not necessarily peer reviewed, but still published, um, can it sit in there somehow? Um, yeah, that are two different aspects. Um, yes, it can fit. So this mm -hmm. is just a, a generic scheme independent of uh, the origin of the data. Um, but actually there's a policy from uh, from the IHFC that um, the the source of data needs to be available somehow and needs to be reported so in best case uh, for 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 modern data you have reports that have a DOI number yeah that uh. there are a lot of database entries um that come from these kind of, where you don't have any documentation or some old cruise report where even if you talk to the people exactly that, um, the, i think there is a the basic criteria is reproducibility and documentation so you need documentation to achieve scientific reproducibility and um if this is not the case we cannot take over the data this ah, is so like, because don't you, make it mm -hmm. Finally, everyone can came and uh, talk about heat flow data here and there. Uh, and if there's no documentation, no uh, no reports, no book, no whatever, um, this is just here sharing, right? But Sven, as, as, as I understood, so the, the a report, a cruise report is sufficient eh? as long as it doesn't really need a DOE or... Oh, in, in particular, the old reports simply do not have a DOI, right? Yeah. Um, this is just so, more for modern reports. So at least, the, the, as I understood, the quality scheme is based on, on the items that are in the new database format or they should, some of them will be added or changed. But the basic idea is that the, the quality scenes comes from all the items that are filled in the, in the new database uh, uh, format, which is currently ongoing and I think it's, it's really there that we should, yeah, put, I think it's a big interest to put also data from, from reports, not only from publications. And for example, uh, the, the database of, um, which is often called the database of uh, Abbott, because it mm -hmm. was taken over by, uh, by uh, uh, Asterok. Eh? And uh, there are a lot of data which are very interesting and sometimes very good, but the only reference is about database. So we don't even know the date of acquisition and something. So this would really be nice if we'd be able to get this correctly into the database. And I think we tried, but especially with the about um, data, we tried to reach out and contact the people that um, documented them. And if I remember correctly, I have to look up the emails on that matter, but it couldn't be, more information couldn't be recovered. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that's... 
Yeah, I, I have one example from an uh, area in the Mediterranean where I was looking for. Mm -hmm. It took me really uh, a lot of, uh, say, almost archaeological research to find yeah. the, the reports of the crews. But it was really interesting and, and it was good data. So it's, it's a pity to not to have them in, the, in, in there. Yeah. So as I, as I said before, so we, we didn't discuss it with, with, with Rob or, or Rachel the, the proposition for the quality scheme for probe data. So it's up to, to us now to, to, uh, to propose. And so I think for the, for the, the first the uncertainty, it's, it's not a real problem. Eh? It's, it's the same for every data. So, so the, the, the most um, discussion should be mainly on the methodological quality. Also the perturbation effects. I don't remember exactly what is in there now. We, should, we can maybe start with this perturbation effects and then go to the more complicated methodological uh, quality uh, number that was uh, proposed for, the, for this kind of scheme. Because for the perturbation effects, it's, it's simply, uh, uh, is it, is, um, well, we should maybe look, is there a slide with uh, some? Uh, yes, it more? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had, uh, let's see, I had one kind of way down here. Yeah, so I called them environmental effects, but they're, they're perturbations, right? So bathymetry. These are, uh, I guess, the common ones, bottom water temperature variation, sedimentation, and then uh, refraction by a conductivity contrast. That one's less common, but the, the first, uh, these three are, are, are more common. So what, what are the ones in, that are currently in the, in the scheme? There are, there, there are five, I think, for the borehole data. Um, yes. Sedimentation and refraction is already included, um, but I found here exactly oh. the, the last one. No, it was one just. Be, uh, Can you? Oh. Yeah, next, next, this one here. This one. Oh, this was too fast. Yeah, the one before. Yes, yeah. this one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. So here you have sedimentation. Oh, go back. One slide. Yes, sedimentation okay. erosion is included here, right? Mm -hmm. But apparently we need to consider bottom water and temperature variation and bathymetry as well. Well, yeah, but the bathymetry, I mean, but I think they're analogs with the boreholes, right? So bathymetry and topography is basically the same correction, once on continents and once under the water. I think the bottom water temperature variation is like a climate, climatic effect, transient climate. It would be a transient bottom water temperature effect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so in, in fact, all, probably all, all the, the environmental effects are there for us also. Yes. Just to, to change the, a little bit the, 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 the semantics of the, Sorry, so of I course, we only have information here, which is important. That is, the effect is present but not corrected for, or that the effect is present and corrected for, or with the X that the effect is not present or not uh, recognized. So, I don't know, um, Sven. What is the is it? Uh, what is the reason to have only the effect not present or not recognized? Is a, is the same tag? Um, um, because I mean, I mean, if it's if it's not present, in the sense that we know that it doesn't exist, it's also uh, uh, that we know that the data should not be corrected, or or I, maybe I'm not correcting uh, correctly uh, interpreting the name effect uh, not present. I mean, if we know that there is no sedimentation effect. Yeah. 
Uh, but maybe that comes in the case then that it's corrected because we consider that we know that there is no sedimentation effect here. So would, would you suggest to split up the effect not present and not recognized? Or? Well, I was a little bit uh, confused by it, but in fact, to my opinion, it's maybe only not, not recognized or not, not evaluated or something. Maybe I'm wrong, huh? maybe you should uh, correct me. Um, uh, I think there are two people uh, putting up their uh, hands. So, so I, th I think I think Ignacio was first, and then Ben. Hi. A quick question. Uh, there is a special case about the the measurements in uh, in areas with uh, strong uh, marine currents, marine currents. I don't know it, because we have uh, some measurements in close to the Gibraltar. Uh, 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 area and I don't know if the currents there are very strong. I don't know if it's there in effect, special effect that can be can be identified in the in the in the curve or something like that. Do you have uh, experience with this? Mm -hmm. Well, from my experience, yes. In some cases, you can see it in the curve of the of the of the, of the gradient measurements. Um, so it's probably an, an, uh, in in the to say in this quality scheme, it will probably come in the evaluation of the of the variations of the of the gradient with depth also in some in some way, because here we will in this part of the of the perturbation effects we will only qualify if if, if it's there if it was corrected. But of course, we we have no information on the on the the effect itself. But it's not it's not very easy to 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 get it out of the signal. I think yes. Flo Florin did some good work also in the, the California Bay of California to try to correct it, but it's not so easy. Well, we correct it for the bottom of the temperature, not for currents. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it's really affecting the, the gradient. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. And also, if you have strong currents, then often the sediment, although not often, but from my limited experience, you just the, the sediment is too sandy sometimes can also be that you just cannot enter with the probe. Mm -hmm. like and? Hmm? And then you don't get data. Yes, it's a major problem. <laughs> I just wanted to, to comment on the, the X. So the reason for the X not present or not recognized is taking care or, or, or once because we are now talking about perturbation effects, which are part of an interpretation of the data you have. And so you, you're assuming that there is no effect. And most mm -hmm. likely there is no effect, but perhaps something will change in future and you realize that there is a bigger system controlling your measurement. And then there's maybe an effect you, you're not aware of. And this is the reason why we have this effect not present or not recognized, or we could also say assumed to be not present. So that's the idea why we end up with the, this X uh, and, and this not recognized or it is not present. So maybe it's, yeah. No, Norbert? Um, yes, uh, we can only look on effects we, we observe or we do not observe. Why do I say this? Because in cases of gas hydrates, we often see um, more or less linear, undisturbed gradient, temperature gradient in the uppermost three, more, three meters or so. And below that, at something like five meters, four meters, six meters, there's a severe uh, disturbance of the temperature gradient. So if you look at the upper three meters, you would say, oh, that's a fine linear gradient. If you look at the uppermost six meters, you see a heavily disturbed gradient. So you can only um, do a judgment on that, uh, what you see. And the other things are, well, just a guess. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course the, 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 which is here, the, the fifth tech, which is called convection fluid flow will be, uh, let's see, uh, it's kind of su subjective uh, tech. Eh? It will be very dependent on the, the person who interprets the data to consider yeah. if there is an effect from fluid from, from hydrates, from, from other processes uh, in, the, in the sediment. So it's the major thing, I think here, it's not a, a quality tag. Eh? It's, uh, it's not a quantification. Uh, there's no quantification in this tag. So it's, it's a kind of uh, indication rather. But on the other hand, remember the, the, the fact that the, in some profiles, for example, where in hydro provinces where the, the, the gradient is not very, the temperature depth profile is not very linear, this should probably come out in the methodological part of this quality scheme, where we can decide, or like it was done before, if there is a change of so much percent, uh, it's a less, less good uh, data in the sense of representative for the regional, uh, for the deeper heat flow. I um, have a question to the scoring for thermal conductivity um, in the methodological part. Um, Ricarda, just one question. Um, does it mean we can, we are fine with the perturbation effects so far? What I, oh, sorry. What, yeah, what I, uh, what I, um, noted was that we could probably uh, fix a bit the wording so assumed to be not present would be a solution and that apparently topography bathymetry um, can be so topography could be changed to type of topography slash bathymetry and mm -hmm. the transient the transient climate um, well slash bottom water temperature variation it, and in this case, um, the, the third part of the scheme must be fully transferable between the marine or the, the borehole or the probe sending uh, application, right? I don't, I don't know if for the convection fluid flow, it, if there is an interest to add hydrate dynamics or something, because it's, it's true, there are a lot of studies on, on in hydrate areas and it's often a problem, well, not often, but there are several places where where hydrates uh, dynamics seems to affect the, the gradient. So it might be a okay. interesting to edit. Uh, as perspectives on that proposal. Which is apparently not mm. the case, but it probably makes sense. We can, I, I've put this in the notes. And then, uh, sorry, Ricardo, now then we can no, switch no, no. to the, okay. then we can switch to the, the methodological evaluation of the quality scheme. Probably we can change the slide again to, to look on the proposal for the Bohm uh, mine scheme on the methods. Oops. This is the one you want? Um, no, probably the more detailed one three or four slides ago. I think we can start with. Uh, no, not the, no, I think this one and the one, yeah, probably this one, yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, Ricardo. <laughs> Ah, yeah, I no, I was just wondering how that would be translated to marine sediment. Because the methods are slightly different. Um, yeah, and I wonder if we discuss this today um, on the different determinations of thermal conductivity for marine measurements. Like we have in situ measurements, the uh, um, whole round, split round with needle probes that sometimes, like ideally from the same location, but sometimes people use the same lithology or, yeah. 
values from literature. Or zoned values from nearby measurements. Yeah. And there are also maybe minimum maximum ranges sensible. Like if you get thermal conductivity of less than 0.6, um, that would be very low. And that's why there's an upper value that makes sense for a sediment. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I think stop me if, <laughs> if you don't agree. Maybe maybe we should ask ourselves, should we start already with the first two steps? The step one, could we adapt it? Is it interesting for the probe data also to have the, the step one evaluation? Probably it, it is, I think, in some way to maybe an adapted step one. Um, but it's probably um, important to know uh, how, uh, how how much temperature measurements we have in the sediment and temperature and conductivity measurements and, and how deep they are because if they're only in the upper meter, there is much more possibility to have a perturbation effect than in deeper ones. So probably this should come in some way already in the, in the step one. I don't know if, if what are your ideas about if we should keep the step one. Because here, step one is only on the, on the kind of depth interval, of course. So how, mm -hmm. yeah, how do we report it to the probe data? And is it, is it also the, the, the first step for the probe data? Yeah, if adopted, you can ask for um, whether perturbation depth is reported. Um, so I think the interval selected by does not make a sense because we do not select intervals right in that term, uh, like for Bohm and mine data. I... We could we could uh, define a kind of min minimum depth that we consider that data should be there minimum sub bottom depth of the sea floor. But on the other hand, we should not eliminate uh, data like uh, from from rough operations or where, where the depth is very shallow, but we have a lot of temperature data which allows to, to qualify better the, the the environment also. We have more information, so it should not uh, put this data out in a very bad quality in some way. Isn't, isn't a minimum depth difficult because if you have very stable bottom water conditions um, that very, like very infinitis infinitesimal, um, then you can get good gradients and shallow penetration depth. But for example, um, from the Antarctic shelf, everything shallower than three meters is difficult in some cases. So if, if we put like a minimum depth interval. So as I understood, it could be a, a combination of uh, people wake, waking up in my house. So, I, <laughs> um, so we, we should maybe in this part find a combination of water depth depth of measurement in the sediments and amount of amount of tem um, temperature measurements i'm not sure if it should be already in the step one but it's with this makes it too complicated yeah uh, you know i would say that um in contrast to borehole data you know i um, you know, we're just using the whole interval of the, the probe, right? And I wouldn't recommend a minimum depth. A lot of times mm -hmm. on those ROV dives or near ridge crests or where the heat flow is really high. And so then any perturbations, right, would be a small percentage of that total, right? So as a, um, so they're just a smaller component. Mm -hmm. 
So I think just, uh, you know, the interval is the whole, you know, series of, of temperature depth measurements that you have from the probe. So penetration? Yeah. So mainly, so the amount of temperature measurements, suppose. Yes, I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. So how many temperature measurements were made to calculate also the, the gradient? So sometimes it's just one and then they take a bottom water temperature measurement and then it's, well, or you have two measurements. So mm -hmm. yeah, at least I think three temperature measurements should be made to get a, a reliable gradient. Yeah, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have three terrible measurements or two excellent measurements. Yeah. But yes, they should be evaluated by the, by the people before you. Yeah. Well, I, okay. we, we could put something like this because we will not reject, of course, data with only two measurements. It's just the quality uh, yes. will be less. Yeah, don't reject any data. I mean, that's that's not the, the, the idea of that. So. There's a lot of data with just one temperature measurement and they use the boiling water temperature to calculate the gradient, which is fine. You get a value, but it mean it needs to be um, in terms of quality, right? So it's not the highest quality, mm -hmm. but it's a fine, a fine measurement. Mm -hmm. So should we simply go something like First uh, information, it's only one. If there is not more than one, it's a bottom temperature, uh, one measurement in the sediments that we have the, the shallowest. I have some problems still to adopt to the scheme. Eh? But uh, so is that, if I understood here with the first questions, you, you first go to the slowest, the, the lowest qualities, yes? You try to eliminate them. Uh, yes. Can you maybe help me? Uh, yes. in, in step one, you mean? Yes, in step one. Yeah, this, uh, you know, uh, actually we, we came, we initially started with step two um, without mm. knowing that this will be finally the step two. <laughs> we <laughs> just thought about, okay, we need to think, uh, talk about saturation somehow in situ and the source, of course. And mm. um, this perfectly works. And then we considered, okay, um, you can have all those information and you probably have a perfect score there, but um, if there is no interval depth recorded, it doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. So there must be a pre-selection and um, therefore we included uh, the step one um, that we have um, first, um, uh, yeah, a pre-selective uh, procedure where we can exclude data uh, from the quality or further quality evaluation when the interval depth is not reported. And I think it's the same with perturbation uh, depth. If the perturbation depth is not not uh, reported um, at all, uh, I see it in a similar way like uh, the interval depth for the borehole mine scale, but please correct me. Uh, probably the perturbation depth is not um, a crucial point for quality evaluation. I, I don't know whether it's in the same way crucial like the interval depth. Uh, if we do not have an interval depth in, 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 the, in the borehole or mine, um, yeah, you don't know where the whole thing in the upper five kilometers is located, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's not necessary for the probe data to have this step one. Huh? Maybe we can fit it all in the step two. Uh, scheme. Yeah, we, we do not need uh, such an artificial uh, separation or differentiation. We can think in a complete new way. Uh, so, mm -hmm. what 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 I what I've learned now is that so a combination of water depth, number of temperature measurements, and penetration depths is mentioned so far as valuable input, right? For the, yes, for the temperature, mm -hmm. certainly. 
and uh, uh, and also I think in some way the which was there before, eh, which is the variability of the, the gradient with depth might also be for the temperature uh, to get the highest quality maybe out of it. Um, I'm not sure for the, for the conductivity, it's of course completely different. And as, as Ricarda and, and uh, other person said, it's it's completely to say more important there. It's probably if if uh, data were required in situ, mm -hmm. then if data were required in situ or on, on course from the same exact spot, which is, and then of course a lot of data also use. Uh, data from nearby stations, sometimes from Sorry, once more. Yeah, but I think don't, don't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> but Keep think, moving your equipment. <laughs> I, th I think it's the first time over the past 15 workshops, so. <laughs> But it keeps the recorded video short and handleable in size. <laughs> chapter three. Yeah, chapter three. That sounds good. It worked with John Wick, so it will work here as well. Doesn't it? So I'm wondering if it's a matter of resolution then also, perturbation length and number of temperature measurements. Is this a quality factor? I can imagine that feeds into it. If you have two measurements in the sediment, and it's probably more difficult to see perturbations like from long-term temperature mm -hmm. variations. But if you have higher resolution every 10 centimeters, you can resolve these effects way better. Yeah. Yeah. And we so, have, we so have mm -hmm. in the Baltic Sea, um, you see these effects of winter and summer quite strongly. So you have a, like a complete reversal of the gradient and they made like leaf shapes, mm. winter and summer. And yeah, I guess the more data you have, like that's an easy example. So I just was wondering if, if not really penetration matters or the length, it matters how many thermistors you have, I think or it's, how many it's, temperature points, measurement points you have. I mean, I think it's both. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you want mm -hmm. a lot of temperature points deep, yeah. right? The, the deeper you are, the, the further you are away from the, the, the bottom, and so you can assume that it's going to be more stable in terms of bottom water or yeah. sedimentation or something like that. So apparently Jeffy did get lost. A lot of attrition. Hey, so, sorry, I I was found some measurements 
with examples of penetration. Can, can I show you? Uh, sure. Can you see this? Uh, yes. So this is Alboran Sea. This is a uh, Iberian Peninsula, and this is Africa. And so, for you, uh, Rob, do you think this measurement, this one, and this one, that only half of the of the thermistor are in? Uh, do you think this is a must, we can we can extract information from this? I think so. I mean, they look they appear linear. They appear the gradients appear consistent with the other measurements. Okay. And and and, and what about this one? Can you see? Yeah, it? I, this, yeah I don't this, know about that one. <laughs> the, you, I think, can be can be a problem because another another question is the 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 contact with the with the mud with the sediments no because have to be you can have like a bulls or, or a bad contact so the measurements will be affected in every test method will will have a different response no but you have like a linear trend but yeah but it's noisier and so i think the you know the 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 uncertainty on the slope is larger than say the other measurements where it's the temperature depth measurements are um, much more linear. And, uh, and then another, another thing was the, this is, sorry, this is the, the conductivity. And we have a, in some points are, you know, like here, the, 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 the desviation or the, the, the noise or the, are very very strong. So, do you have a? For, for example, I think we cannot uh, extract a rel reliable reliable uh, heat flow measurement from this point, even if the gradient is is good, right? Yeah. Uh, you might right. be able to. I mean, I would make a a Bullard plot and see how linear the. Uh, temperature versus thermal resistances. Okay. Are there cores from that region? Is that even mm, core? In some of them, yes. Not, maybe not in the point, but close to, to the point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, this is from the 90s, so it's very old. I don't think we have nothing from, from that time. Sir. Ignacio, if, if okay, I, I would like to switch back uh, and uh, to keep us on track um, due to time. Probably, what um, what we could do, we um, instead of looking on on, on this scheme, probably we just um, um, start from scratch um, with our own whiteboard and uh, writing things down. Try to create something um, uh, to. Do not be too close to the borehole and mine scheme and biased by this one. So what I what I understood so far is that for conductivity, for example, um, there are different aspects. Uh, so we could have data from in situ date, uh, mm -hmm. so in situ probes, mm, and then measurement. Um, on the cores with a needle probe from the same location or region. So core needle probe. And uh, then um, if I just, I have a few suggestions on that. Um, or where we, because we discussed this also. Um, the thermal conductivity derived from porosity measurements on sediment samples or cores. 
um, derived via the geometric mean and the course from the same location or region. And yeah, that could be as a suggestion. Okay, so where to include? Just for, uh, sorry, Florian asked for the new link I, um, on the other platform. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, for thermal conductivity measurement. Yes. Um, how they are done. Yeah. So we had in situ with needle probes from porosity. In situ from needle probe with porosity. So uh, like the third point is porosity. Yeah, okay. Um, the fourth point could be from published data in the region. And the fifth from derived from lithology. That could be And then ideally, you have in situ measurements in the sediment with the ambient temperature pressure. So that has like the highest scoring, and all the other ones have subsequently lesser scoring. As a suggestion. Yeah. Well, I think there should be, in, on the third place, it should be at uh, measurement, well, assumed measurement from a nearby station. So what I did in the Guaymas Basin, we, I made 50 meter spacing measurements and then I made a full measurement and then I skipped one and then I made another one. But I think it's, the mm -hmm. sediment doesn't change between 50 meters. So I think it's very good um, conductivity mm -hmm. value. So it should, that should be included and maybe should be in the third place. Yeah, I agree also that the, the, I should say the, the distance play, plays a role. So we probably do, do not expect such, in most areas, not such big changes, although we, we know it happens. But I mean, if we have data uh, connectivity values of really nearby, so I spe like, like Florian said, if you do some, some measurements and then you do a station, I don't know, a few hundred meters of, well, maybe at maximum one kilometer from the spot, you can maybe it consider better than, than if you take an, a station from earlier published data, which are like, uh, I don't know, 10 kilometers away. Yeah, I agree. Um, the course should be from the same location or region. Yeah. In the second spot. Of course, it is difficult to judge the, the variation, the variability in the area. Yeah, that can be a case to case scenario. Um, my, my most, um, my experience is from the Antarctic shelf, and there it can really change the lot. <laughs> yes. Um, a mess. Well, I think once you're on the shelf, uh, <laughs> it's much harder. Um, yeah. uh, Ricarda, can you just once more specify the point three? Uh, I did not get yeah. it fully. The porosity? What, um, what? We noted derived from porosity measurements of sediment samples or cores. Um, and yeah, via geometric mean. And the core, again, is from the same location or region, which includes if you have a better spot, 100 meters or one mile um, apart. And yeah, I guess this was also a good way because the porosity is often measured anyway um, on the core sample. Okay, so derived from porosity plus application of geometric mean. Any thoughts on that? Uh, a suggestion again. Okay, once more, please. Uh, I was um, asking uh, oh. the, the, the thoughts on that as a suggestion. But do the others agree or disagree with this point? So 
Sven, could you put it a little bit uh, uh, zoom out on the on the better that way? Well, no, opposite. I mean, could we see the the five points in uh, that are listed now for the moment? Oh, I uh, okay. I this is okay. What specifically should I do? I do not get the point now. I just don't see. I can't read the the, the five points for the moment. I don't. You don't see it. Well, it's too too much zoomed zoomed in for me. I don't know if it's the same. For the... Does this change here? You have a you have a zoom button. I think. Ah, okay. The... Yeah, I see. Sorry, I didn't know you. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Ah, on point two, same spot or region. Okay. For, for point one, should we keep the, the pressure in there? I mean, it's not something that we we measure very often in C2. I think um, I just mentioned it, that um, this means, uh, in my understanding, in situ, that we have a measurement directly in the sediment in situ with the given pressure temperature conditions, not that yeah. the te pressure temperature is necessarily recorded. Okay, but I think we can leave out pressure because in situ, normally for, for probe measurements means that it's it's in the conditions of, of actual pressure and temperature. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So actually, point five and six are probably uh, probably the same because uh, if I use data from lithology, it means that apparently I use data from literature, right? If there was a cruise nearby that took cores and they measured thermal conductivity, then I would say that is a difference to using typical sediment values, maybe. Yeah. Okay, this is point four, yeah. data from nearby. And then, sorry, is it only me that sees that the, the temperature on the same spot of the conductivity text? I have two texts, one on the, one on the other, maybe. Ah, no, I can see. If I can, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, what? The text is jumping around. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, it was better just a few seconds. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's not. Oh. No, this is okay. This is okay, Sven, for me, at least. I can read it. Yeah, but it's, it's not. I don't know what happens here. I think Zoom is not. Did not manage to go. So probably this way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would I would uh, combine point five and six actually. Because in point four, we have data from nearby locations that could be either published or measured. And in point five, then we could data from uh, lithology um, or from literature. So without any, without any context to the actual location or connection. I I don't know about the others, but I cannot see the list again. You cannot see it. And now I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So sorry, Sven, I was also a bit yeah. distracted. Uh, you propose to, to combine four and five? Uh, five and six. No, four yeah. is just... Ah, I, don't, I don't see six, sorry. 
No, it's not present anymore. So yeah. um, because a four is simply data from nearby locations. Yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that could be either measured or published. Mm -hmm. And uh, five then would be the worst category. So data from just generic lithology descriptions uh, or from the literature somewhere mm -hmm. in, in oceans. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think, and you know, I'm just looking at this, I think number two is a little bit restrictive. Um, certainly, if you're getting the cores from piston or gravity coring, you're going to use needle probes. But if you're drilling, using the drill ship or maybe Mebo or whatever, you might uh, use uh, a different technique, a half space or a divided bar or something mm -hmm. like that. So it's a, you know, a laboratory measurement of, of thermal conductivity as opposed to an in-situ measurement. And it would be good, you know, if that method was specified somewhere, I, I suppose, as well. Well, at least in the database, the method is specified, eh? so. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is a question. Do we treat um, trolling project like marine, like the other measurements, or are there like terrestrial borehole measurements? Um, well, it's kind of a hybrid. Get... Yeah, it is. It's a hybrid, but you know, I, I imagine that if you're looking at at an ocean or a sea, you're gonna and you want to compile all the heat flow measurements, you're gonna use both probe measurements and drilling measurements if they exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, how many drilling locations do we have in comparison to, um, for example, violin ball probes as, uh, or just sediment measurements? Oh, um, for, yeah, for sure. That's a minority of the measurements. So still, I mean, the needle probe um, is a very, or the most reliable on board. Um, I... I don't know about the other coring measurements. I don't know if we should change this scheme in order to fit this hybrid drilling or, yeah. Um, I don't know if it makes sense because of the amount of measurements from the different methods. I mean. Well, I think it's covered with the lab measurements at the same spot. Mm -hmm. So now you cover drilling and um, but probe. you don't you don't distinguish between the different methods, and that's the thing. I, I have a question related to it. In, in the general database, we 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 also separate well, not completely, but I mean, in some way, to enter the data, there is a borehole scheme, and then the one for the probe dating data, probe sensing data. The one for uh, offshore uh, uh, boreholes do do they follow the scheme of the boreholes or the probe? Sensing it. Um, actually, in the in the scheme, we we do not have the further uh, separation between marine and continental, because mm. this was the basic idea uh, mm. over the past decades, and this was um, is now transferred to the separation of data origin, so borehole mine uh, mm -hmm. or uh, probe sensing. So in this term, um, when temperature data are derived from probes, uh, uh, like we are discussing today, that is clearly a probe sending scheme. And um, um, just with the add-on that some of the probes do not derive connectivity and this is taken in, uh, in ships on board. Uh, so this means that IODP data, for example, will go in, in the borehole scheme. Yeah, for example, even so, there are apparently boreholes in the, in the ocean, and we we also have lake lakes on, on continents where we can use those techniques, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But um, from the from the scheme of uh, of the database, we do not separate marine, continental, but uh, probe and borehole data. Mm -hmm. so, so, in that case, for the quality, it's probably also this data will also follow the 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 borehole quality scheme and not this one. Um, yeah, that's fine. 
or is it maybe not completely adapted? So that's, that's a bit of a question. Yeah, yeah if you have, if you have I, IODP data, um, so it really uh, IODP boreholes, then that is a borehole scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use probes, then we have a probe scheme. Mm -hmm. For example, Me Mebo, I don't have an experience with the Mebo, but is, does this follow the, the borehole scheme or is this? With Mebo or mine? Mine data? No, no the, the Mebo, which is this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, it's the fiber core. No? Well, uh, so a, it has a dr proper drill. High drill, so yeah. Yeah, it would follow the borehole scheme. Okay. Okay. Um, looking on the left side, connectivity. Are there other connectivity aspects we did not have considered so far? Or uh, is, is this a first good attempt or first good approach for conductivity, what we have here? Well, if um, uh, IODP and MIBO fall under the BOHO category, we could do lab measurements. Um, we could change it back to needle probes, couldn't we? Or maybe lab measurements more general. But... Yeah, it doesn't exclude. Uh... Um, there is in there is in the database also a lot of uh, information about the fact if it was done in the lab under the pressure temperature conditions or nearby. So, mm -hmm. but I think it goes maybe it goes too too deep to put it in the scheme here. But there is a possibility to evaluate it uh, in more precisely. Yeah. Yeah. We could the only, the only what I was thinking still was uh, is it important to add the fact if there is for example only one connectivity measurement or if, if you have at least a, a, well, a series of measurements on different depth intervals and, uh, is this important to add it or, or, or not? I uh, think it depends on the quality so if you uh, uh, say okay most of the measurements or all measurements are needle measurements and they are the best measurements you can do then it's fine but if you have also other types of measurements which may introduce other arrows so that maybe the rank two position is not longer valid it should be relevant to address the lab measurement which was applied but that yeah so I, I think it, we should uh, keep the information, if there is any, on the kind of lab measurement. Mm -hmm. So just for reproducibility and documentation, we should know which type of lab measurement has been applied or was applied there. Um, so mm -hmm. this is why we do have this in the continental scheme as well. So there's a major impact if you uh, how you you perform the measurement, or if the sediment has dried out already, or whatever. Well, variations are much less than in, in continental. Yeah, I could expect. So it's it's a little bit less important probably here than, uh, and it, it will complicate, of course, a lot of the scheme if we add, if you put this in into the this quality scheme. What does if we? duplicate the second point uh, in terms that we have the uh, 2a which is um, corresponds to corrected for in situ conditions or measured under assumed uh, pt conditions and uh, simply onboard ambient conditions to to consider the fact that some sometimes um, yeah uh, they use ambient ship measurements or sometimes they correct somehow, you know, because, you know, Jeffrey, you mentioned you, um, pressure is probably not the point, but with three kilometer water depth, you have some load on it, which makes a difference compared to, I, there, to well, onboard ship measurements, isn't it? it? It makes a small difference, but I, I, I think it's almost never done, these corrections, first of all. And the, probably the correction, while well, I read it once, is, is relatively small. So um, it's a, I know if we do our measurements in, on, on board, on the course, we always also try to, do we measure it immediately or do we 
put the core back to the, the, the temperature that is on the bottom. So we try to do as best as possible because but of all the operations on the core, it's very difficult. But then in the end, I mean, the, I don't think that it's the, the effect is so, so important, but well, maybe I, I'm wrong. Perhaps it's uh, uh, a way to, to differentiate between uh, needle measurements and others. So if you say that most of them are kind of needle measurements, then it's fine. Then you know it's the common one. And if there is something special, then you maybe know you it, it you maybe know it's worth digging deeper. Mm -hmm. Just not to lose information. Yes. Well, we should maybe discuss it later. I'm also not I know there are some other types of measurements to do on the soft sediments, but they're not so well, not so commonly used. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know really the, the difference in the quality between a probe measurement and, and the other type. So we, we only use a probe uh, measurements in the lab. So, but maybe we can uh, discuss this. Okay. Off, off, uh, off the yeah, okay, probably um, um, can we agree to take this as a first approach for conductivity? We can further discuss in, in person in, in Potsdam. Um, so given the time, I think um, I personally have the next meeting at, at nine, so that is in roughly 10 minutes. Um, we, so I would suggest that we can have another five minutes um, to talk about the temperature part here. And then we should agree, I think, about the next steps and um, what we should consider for the in-person workshop. That would be my proposal for now. So yeah, how to approach the temperature evaluation here. So for the moment, you we have number one, number of temperature measurements. So you should probably, so one is the, it's like the best score. Yeah? Um, so we should define maybe an amount of numbers that we think is min minimal, yeah, or. or I thought like, this is just a list I have written right, doing, it's, doing. It's, not, it's not a, a proposal for uh, an ordering or so. Yeah. Uh, not also, a sort. Um, on the number of temperature measurements, I was just wondering, um, it, it su suggests a bit that the more numbers or the higher no the number is, the better the measurement. But it also depends a bit um, what you want to investigate, right? Mm -hmm. So I, if you, yeah. I agree, it's, it's difficult because of course, if you're looking at fluid flow processes or <laughs> something, it's not the linearity that it's important or, or the amount of measurements always so. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult point to, but I think the, the how to say the, it's like a first order quality estimation. Eh? So people who are looking to some specific processes, I think they will not take this uh, quality value as a, as a criteria to select data. Mm. So, so pro probably we should not, be too much worried about uh, looking at special processes, but more as, as a, what, what I think is uh, the, the heat flow, which is more representative for the deeper part. That's, I'm not sure. But... Should be resolution considered. So like a number of measurements to the length of the probe or the penetration. Yeah, the problem is in that case that, that you differentiate between rough data with rough probes, which are very short, like 60 centimeters, where you have a lot of uh, points. And yeah, but maybe the relative one can be an indication. Huh? Um, Again, it depends on the processes you look at. If mm -hmm. you look at uh, fluid flow in the upper sediment, uh, sediment meter, 
um, you want to have small scale effects re resolved with your um, sensors, but if you want to have a gradient, um, yeah. yeah but we than... want to look to the best heat flow value. And so I'm just wondering, so if we could end up with a kind of scoring where we combine these effects. So looking for okay. the maximum depth, looking for the highest resolution and stuff like this. So just finding some scoring issue similar to what we developed for the continental scheme. So it's not a, a, just one thing criteria, but yeah. a way of mixing maybe or combining. And a, uh, a problem which we probably don't solve in three minutes. Yeah, I also think it's a bit. Yeah, it's just to just to, to <laughs> maybe Sven just to write it down. Kind of resolution it could be uh, uh, a further point. So you have how many? Uh, um, what to say? Levels you have? for each uh, it, on the current scheme for the boreholes? It's five, like five, five, or? Uh, well, uh, yeah. we have a matrix on... F five by five, or? Yeah, oh, we just... Just to, to have an idea how much categories we should define more or less. Oh, we are open. We it can be more or less. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sure. Not important to have exactly this. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I agree with Ricardo. We should take some time to make some proposals for this and then discuss it. Uh, I don't know, Ricardo, you will be there also in a... Unfortunately not, no. Okay. But um, I, I suggest that uh, probably um, um, everyone is free to, to make a small proposal by email to this round over the next days before the Chamek meeting. If you have an idea in mind, just make a sketch of it or make a photo of what you're drawing down on a paper, a sheet of paper or so, uh, just um, um, to keep the creative process ongoing. Because I know everyone will leave the room and then over the next days you will have some ideas if you're thinking about this. So we should uh, um, save those ideas uh, because in two weeks they're probably gone. Or you are busy with um, flights into Antarctica or whatever. <laughs> so, sorry, one more thing here in close to uh, penetration, also inclination or, or tilting is very important. I, very I agree. Relevant. I agree. Tilting, yes. For for both, no, for both, if the conductivity is also measured in 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 situ, it's also relevant. It was it was in the in the scheme. But uh, in the previous scheme that the Rob so showed before, but here I think is very important. Okay, um, then I just make a screenshot here, and I think I will stop the. Okay, save this one. Perfect. Close the whiteboard. Um, Yes, great. First of all, that uh, we made it on short notice to the first marine workshop for a long time, I think. Uh, uh, second grade is that uh, we will see each other in two weeks, <clears throat> despite of those who are going on a mission. But uh, at least, Rob, for you, that's a chance to have a short uh, trip to Europe. Uh, on short notice, so if uh, if you think this is worth to come, uh, you're very much invited. And uh, if you need help with um, uh, travel organization, just give me a call. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I will circulate the minutes uh, after winding through the three videos for, from today. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, asking you for comments and corrections. Um, uh, it's a bit diff difficult to uh, discuss and to write notes on the same time. Um, so I hope you will find yourself and your comments uh, um, uh, in this draft. And then I think, yeah, I'm pretty much looking forward uh, to the Chamak meeting and uh, that we continue this process um, coming to a good solution for a quality scheme.
So thank you, so, Sven. For thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, guys. Good night and bye. nice day, whatever. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.